Good morning. Thank you for watching this presentation on the report Earth and Time, reading for a committee of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine for the Earth Science Division of the Geo Directorate of the National Science Foundation. EAR asked the National Academies to develop a vision for their sciences in the coming decade with three specific tasks. First, to identify a concise set of high priority questions that may potentially transform our understanding of the Earth. Second, to assess Earth sciences infrastructure, including the currently supported by EAR, and analyze any gaps between the existing infrastructure and what may be needed to address the priority questions. The third task was a discussion of partnerships with other agencies within and beyond NSF that could maximize EAR's ability to address the priority questions. The committee reflected the breadth of expertise in our sciences from the biological to the physical, with a focus from the core to the clouds and laboratory computational and field-based approaches. The committee held seven in-person committee meetings, both open with stakeholders and closed committee meetings to deliberate and write the report. In this presentation, I will outline briefly the vision of the report, as well as the science priority questions that are most important for the computational infrastructure for genomics, discuss some of the needed infrastructures and the initiatives recommended by the report too. EAR confirmed its mission to support basic science by considering the Earth as an integrated system whose components interact on vast scales of time and space from milliseconds to billions of years and from nanometers to thousands of kilometers. The statement that we need all hands on deck reflects the integration of sub-disciplines as well as the societal relevance of many of the priority questions. Realizing this vision will depend on scientists who are intellectually and demographically diverse, who are individual investigators, as well as those participating in larger research teams and networks, and who have expertise in analytical, computational, and field-based methods. To identify the science priority questions, the committee analyzed community perspe perspectives, both from reviewing white papers, of holding town halls and a community-wide questionnaire. The committee honed in on a small set of priority questions that are both of fundamental importance in earth science. Many of the priority questions reflect earth as an integrated system, technological advances that enable new observations and computational models, and the societal relevance of basic research. It is important to emphasize that the priority questions are not meant to exclude other areas of research. Basic research will always have the potential to lead to unanticipated transformative results. These are the 12 science priority questions that the committee determined. And while uh, normally the briefing would include details on all of them, only going to focus on those that are most relevant to the computational infrastructure for geodynamics starting. We start with the core where the Earth's magnetic field is generated, which is essential for life because it keeps the solar wind from stripping away the atmosphere. It's an ancient feature measured in rocks over 3 billion years old and yet extremely changeable on timescales of both billions of years and on human timescales, where changes in the strength of the magnetic field can impact navigation and satellite communication. The energy required to maintain the magnetic field is enormous, and a consensus has emerged that it arises primarily from the freezing of the fluid outer core onto the solid inner core. And yet, we think that the inner core is less than a billion years old, if not via inner core freezing, how was the magnetic field produced over most of Earth's history? Could we detect a change in the driving mechanism in the rock record? And that led to the first priority question, how is Earth's internal magnetic field generated? The second uh, fundamental question that we have come up with is when, why, and how the plate tectonic starts. Plate tectonics frames nearly all geological phenomena from the crust to the deep interior. It underpins efforts to understand the physical processes that determine the surface deformation and, magma and magmatism responsible for geohazards, the storage and evolution of elements critical to biological activity in modern society, the evolution of life and biogeochemical cycles, the long-term climate change, and the extent of flooding due to present-day sea level rise. And yet, fundamental questions remain about when plate tectonics started, exactly as it operates today, how it developed, and why it developed here and not elsewhere. In the question of plate tectonics, the storage and cycling of elements that are critical to biological activity and modern society is mentioned. And this leads to the third fundamental question of how are critical elements distributed and cycled in the Earth. Certain elements have been dramatically redistributed in the Earth at different times in its history, resulting in major changes in the composition of the atmosphere and oceans with consequence for the evolution of life. 
Minerals and host these elements are transformed by processes related to fluids, melts, and deformation. And we need to understand these processes to understand the global cycling system, including how life and minerals have co-evolved. The next decade will see innovative research and elements that are critical for the technological energy and other needs of society, as well as for creating the conditions for planetary habitab habitability, which leads to this urgent question poised here. Earthquakes are a sudden onset geohazard that pose a profound and ongoing threat to lives and property. They're understood to occur as sudden motions of the earth caused by rapid slip on planar faults. However, recent observations have revealed that earthquake rupture is geometrically and dynamically complex at all scales, and that earth deforms through ordinary earthquakes, through slow earthquakes, and through diverse mechanisms that are completely aseismic. This deformation occurs over a broad range of temporal scales, from the seconds associated with rapid slip to millions of years of plate tectonics. The diversity of deformation styles has caused us to reconsider the very nature of earthquakes and their dynamics. And we pose a deceptively simple question, what actually is an earthquake? Volcanic eruptions also pose a grave threat to society and are among the most spectacular and complex manifestations of the dynamic earth systems. Eruption of large igneous provinces that have occurred in Earth's past are far larger than any historical eruption and are linked with some of Earth's most significant mass extinctions. Somewhat smaller but still massive and catastrophic eruptions have occurred in magmatic systems such as Yellowstone Caldera. These eruptions are more frequent, frequent, still dwarf any eruption in the historic record, and would have horrific consequences for the modern world. Volcano science stands poised to anticipate the duration, magnitude, and intensity of future eruptions through physics-based modeling of all key processes that drive them. Such models will be informed by the wealth of data that new technologies provide, much of which is now available in real time hence leading to this question of what drives volcanism. Great progress has been made in understanding our system interactions linking climate tectonics and erosion to understand how they shape and are dynamically influenced by Earth's surface topography. This progress has revealed unexpected connection, connections and brought into focus key scientific questions that must be addressed to understand them. And these are linked uh, directly uh, to the solid Earth's interior. For example, how do rock mechanical properties, short-term actors such as storms, and the rheology and dynamics of Earth's interior influence landscape evolution? And how do landscapes co-evolve with the atmosphere, cryosphere, sea level, and life? The relevance to humans is also more urgent than ever. New technology for measuring topography over geologic to human time scales, as well as modeling of landscape evolution, now makes it possible to address the key scientific question of what are the causes and consequences of topographic change. Over the last century, earthquakes, tsunami, volcanic eruptions, landslides, and flooding have killed many millions of people and caused many trillions of dollars in economic losses. Recent analyses show that fundamental aspects of geohazards need to be better understood through earth science research. Even the most thoroughly studied regions, for example, Hawaii for volcanoes and Japan for tsunami, continue to reveal unanticipated results regarding the frequency and severity of catastrophic events. Fundamental science questions must be addressed to have a predictive and quantitative understanding of geohazards. This leads us to pose this last grand challenge question for the next decade. How can our sciences research reduce the risk and toll of geohazard? Analyzing existing facilities, infrastructures, capability gaps, and the connections to the scientific questions was the second task of the committee, and is summarized by this chart here, which you can find in the report, which you can download from www.nap.edu. Our analysis of infrastructure and facilities led to recommendations, not all of which I will outline here, but I will start with this one, which is the EAR-supported facilities and the entire portfolio of EAR-supported infrastructure should be regularly evaluated, including the possible sunsetting of facilities as needed to adapt to changing scientific priorities. I highlight here one difference in our approach to discussing and analyzing infrastructure and it's the focus on people as an essential third component of infrastructure. And that is highlighted here in terms of humans. Um, we refer to the people who design, build, maintain, operate, and continually improve hardware and software tools. Describing people as an essential component of infrastructure reflects the view that future Earth scientists will need new skills to develop the next generation of instruments and to access and utilize the available information in new ways. EAR has an opportunity during the coming decade to be creative and intentional in developing this expertise so as to build an increasingly instrument savvy, cyber capable and more diverse and inclusive workforce.
their analysis of infrastructure and facilities led to a series of recommendations for new initiatives, which I won't discuss here. You can find them in the report, but I would like to highlight one, which is that EAR should support continued community development of the SC4D initiative, including the community network for volcanic eruption and response. EAR faces a challenge in keeping pace with the rapidly evolving computational landscape, including issues related to data management and archiving, meeting fair data standards, and evolving computational needs. So one of the recommendations is that EAR should initiate a community-based standing committee to provide advice regarding, regarding cyber infrastructure needs and advances, as well as provide, uh, develop and implement a strategy to provide support for fair data practices within the community. Human infrastructure is absolutely fundamental to the success in implementing the vision put forth in the report. And yet, there are some challenges in developing and sustaining sufficient capacity, expertise, and diversity. To that end, there were two recommendations made to EAR. One, that it should commit to long-term funding that develops and sustains technical staff capacity, stability, and competitiveness. And second, in a move that was prescient, that EAR should enhance its existing efforts to provide leadership, investment, and centralized guidance to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion within the earth sciences community. Without diversity, equity, and inclusion, the scientific goals, including those of CIG, will be very difficult to realize. The third task of the committee related to partnerships, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all of them, but one of the very important conclusions is that earth sciences is increasingly global and EAR funded researchers benefit from international collaboration. The result, the recommendations actually look at, uh, actually suggest to EAR that should actively collaborate with other geo divisions as it already does and other agencies to fund geosciences researchers that crosses boundaries. And the EAR should also proactively partner with other NSF divisions and federal agencies to advance novel society relevant research. I leave you with these final thoughts and specifically the first one that EAR's mission and by extension CIG's is more important and urgent than ever.